Greetings, fellow Classic TV fans. Although he won two Emmys for his role on Hogan's Heroes, Warner Klimperer only agreed to play the part of Colonel Clank once he was assured that the character was, for the most part, incompetent. Reportedly, this was a moral stance for him. He and his Jewish family had to flee their homeland of what would soon become Nazi Germany. They immigrated to the U.S., and later Werner served in the U.S. Army during World War II. Actors John Banner, who played the lovable Sergeant Schultz, I see nothing, I know nothing, and Leon Askin, who played the fearsome General Burkhalter, I never knew you were so ruthless, were both Jewish-born Austrians. Fortunately, prior to the war, they immigrated to the U.S. as well. During World War II, Bannon served in the Air Force and Askin in the United States Army Air Force. So besides the shared history, these three actors had a couple other things in common. They got to play the German bad guys on Hogan's Heroes. Well, Schultz wasn't so bad. And in real life, their wartime service for the American Armed Forces during World War II made them the real heroes. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans. In 1975, a new sci-fi TV show came from across the Atlantic called Space 1999. The British-Italian production filmed two seasons with a total of 48 episodes. Created by the legendary Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, it differed from their well-known Super Marionation productions like The Thunderbirds and Supercar. This was live action. As some of you know, it's the story of the moon base alpha colonists and their adventures after a nuclear accident makes the moon break away from the Earth's orbit, thus turning it into a giant spaceship. Reportedly, to appeal to U.S. television networks, two Americans were cast for the lead roles. Martin Landau, along with his real-life bride and former Mission Impossible co-star Barbara Bain, landed the parts of Commander John Koenig and Dr. Helena Russell. Space 1999 had a couple of interesting Star Trek and Star Wars connections as well. Martin Landau was originally offered the role of Mr. Spock, and after he left Mission Impossible, Leonard Nimoy joined that cast. Fred Friedberger was also a producer on Star Trek and was later brought in to work on this show. The Star Wars villains Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, who were also well-established from the classic Hammer horror films, both made guest appearances. Although a third season was planned, with disappointing reviews, the show was canceled with no real finale. But like many shows of its kind, Space 1999 became a fan favorite in many countries thanks to the magic of reruns. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans. Batman has had his fair share of supervillains to battle, including one that doubled as a love interest. The Batman Catwoman saga has been in the storyline for the better part of 80 years. During the first two seasons of the classic TV show, the incredible Julie Newmar donned the seductive black cat suit. As well as having an acclaimed career on Broadway and in films, Newmar also appeared in many classic TV shows. There was The Twilight Zone, Route 66, Star Trek, Get Smart, The Monkees, the list goes on. As an innovative clothing designer, she gained three U.S. patents for her creations in women's undergarments. As a nutrition and healthy living advocate, she claims to have never smoked, drank, or taken drugs in her life. And she's renowned for being highly gracious to her fans. So with all this, I would say casting Julie Newmar as our bad but good Catwoman was the perfect choice. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans. Don Kirshner's rock concert ran from 1973 to 81 and was a staple of late night television. Beginning with Kirshner acting as executive producer and musical consultant for the original series In Concert, that show excelled in the ratings. This was an impressive feat up against the well-established Dick Cavett show, whose ratings it doubled. And in some areas, it even beat out Carson's Tonight Show. Reportedly, Don and his music director Wally Gold started the whole thing by having to beg artists to perform on the show and for scale pay, which was much lower than what they were used to. But once the acts came to their senses about the publicity power of television, Kirshner and Gold said they had more than they knew what to do with. Now they're begging us, they claimed. And they were everybody. From pop to punk and all points in between, the sheer amount of legendary musicians who appeared on Don Kirshner's rock concert was astounding. Of course, Don had some other musical TV exploits, such as the Archies and the Monkees, too, but Rock Concert gave the audience a chance to see some of their favorite acts playing live. Combined with facilitating many 1960s music classics at New York's infamous Brill Building, Kirshner's legacy of intertwining the industries of music and television means that all of us fans and artists owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Greetings, fellow classic TV fans. In 1956, a young visionary named Dick Clark became the host of a popular Philadelphia-based TV show called Bandstand. 
The following year, ABC conducted an affiliate poll on what they should fill an open national slot with. Clark sensed an opportunity and pushed hard to get Bandstand picked up. And in 1957, that push paid off as the newly dubbed American Bandstand went coast to coast. It not only featured hit records, but included performances by the musical artists. Dick Clark also made an indelible social impression. How? By his insistence of racial integration of both the music as well as the cast. Showing that young voices mattered too was the segment called Greater Record. This coined that popular catchphrase, it's got a good beat and you can dance to it. The legacy of Dick Clark and his American Bandstand charged ahead for over 30 years and forever changed the landscape of both music and television. Greetings fellow classic TV fans. In 1963, a half hour game show called Let's Make a Deal hit the television airwaves. The ever popular host of the show, Monty Hall, also co-created and produced the program. Each episode's contestants would be randomly picked by Hall himself. And the trick was just how to get Monty's eye. Reportedly, a trend began with audience members wearing crazy hats and it just escalated from there. Originally, most everybody came dressed in everyday business attire. Monty Hall claimed one day a woman came to the show dressed in a chicken suit and so he picked her. Well, that trend was set and it grew and grew. As a matter of fact, within a month of the premiere, the entire audience of contestants came dressed in crazy costumes. This unwritten, unexpected premise of the show just made it that much more fun to watch. And it definitely helped shape the timeless popularity of Monty Hall's Let's Make a Deal.